months before the G20, they had a new agency that handles police complaints in Ontario called the Office of the Independent Review Director. Yeah, the OIPRD. There's police, the word police in there somewhere. So I filled out my official complaint with them, which was basically I took my 11,000 word Facebook note and I said, this is what happened. It had all the officers' badge numbers and names in there that I could remember. Very detailed, what cell block I went to, what I, what I was doing. Um, and they received that, and uh, they gave me a notification that uh, they had received it um, about two, uh, three weeks after I submitted it. They just said they were overwhelmed with all the response from G20. They had to hire like a whole secondary set of staff. And then uh, the RCMP, I did my official complaint with them, and they got back to me within a week saying, Obvi it's obvious from my complaint that the RCMP is not who my complaint is about. So they didn't, they didn't do anything wrong with my story. I just talked with the Office of the Independent Review Director about my file at the end of June, and they told the, uh, the, the, the investigator I was talking to said that they have to interview still five officers from the Novotel, and the commanding officer of the Novotel has yet to agree to give an interview. So my complaint has gone nowhere because the arresting officer it has not agreed to be interviewed. I asked about the detention center and the footage from the detention center and she was got confused and said, I think two other investigators are handling everything from the detention center, but I don't think they're watching any video. And that's the official body to investigate police complaints in Ontario. So that's where I am with those things. So through my relationship with the Toronto Star, they're going to help with a freedom of information request. It's been very busy over the past year to get the video of me out from the cell. Some advice that I had received before about trying to get the video is that I would need to get like a release from the 39 other guys in my cage. So I could try to find the homeless guy. I could try to find the three guys from Germany. Um, that actually, one of them has I received Facebook messages from one of those guys and the 16-year-old kid since then. Um, but it's just, well, I want to see where it goes. Because for me, when the video comes out of the gay prisoners being put into their own segregated area. It's not something I could cover in the show because it's something I discovered later. The young gay couple that was in my cage actually got moved into their own cell with other uh, homosexual prisoners as well. Um, and when they see 40 men screaming for water, guards watching 40 women go to the washroom, because uh, audio was recorded as well, an officer making a Holocaust joke, uh, other officers using sexuality and gender as a weapon and it's of intimidation and fear against the citizens, uh, or, or, you know, citizens is a bad word, uh, anyone, that was, anyone that was there, members of our community. When the rest of Canada sees that, I know, I know something will happen. Like, I, I just have to believe in my heart that when we see that, happening in the streets of Toronto. Because right now, it's not being talked about. It's, it's just, that stuff isn't out there. That's what I need to see. And that's, for example, for in the show, it just wasn't me telling the story for the whole moment. I had discussions saying, I need people to see what 40 people locked in a tiny cage, screaming for water, looks like. Because no matter how good a storyteller I might be, I can't explain that. In, in this, we live in, in a society that's fractured along class lines, race lines, gender, sexual orientation. And these are structural fact, um, features of the society that divides people, whether you're part of the working class or part of middle class groups or ruling class um, groups. If you're racialized or you're white, there are different um, experiences. For years, the African community has been complaining about police brutality here in Toronto. There have been protests, there have been questionable shootings, and there was just no serious level of resonance among the majority in the society. Because people are saying, okay, you, you must have been doing something wrong, why the police is over policing this particular community. And, and so it's very interesting when white people start to experience police brutality very visibly, then people are saying like, well, something is wrong. But at the same time, initially, about 73% of Torontonians thought police handled things just right. Yeah. 
but no, after a year of a very strong advocacy from the Toronto Star, from the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, from trade union groups, from other groups doing political education, public education about what took place, when people start to see people that they can identify with racially, then now about 54% of Torontonians believe that the police didn't handle um, the demonstration right, that they did something wrong. But it took a year of public education and focusing on individual stories and people can identify with racially with the people who experienced that. But if you go I don't know how many people came to us with the stories about the way they were told, um, whether they were good protesters, you know, whether they were indeed, uh, uh, were they radicals, uh, and this sort of uh, illegitimacy of protest that you have to, it's, it's almost a right that you have to uh, claim as a privilege as opposed to recognizing that it's important in our society to allow people to petition their government, you know, to tell their government what they think. You know, a democracy is not just you vote once every four years. It's about governance by the people for the people. And the people that are elected need to hear from their from from the, the population. I mean, they get to hear from lobbyists all the time, you know. Uh, uh, the rich people have their lobbyists and the poor people have their feet. And at some point, you know, you have to accept that if you want a diversity of perspective, you know, governments need to know when people are ready to stand up for something and walk for something. So I think to, we are devaluating the, the democracy when we don't recognize how important it is for things that you support and things that you don't support, whether it's pro-life or pro-choice, you have to say, well, I respect the right of people being heard because the next day it could be me. It could be my and I think at the back of my head, I knew all this stuff happened. I didn't want to, I guess I, I didn't want to believe it or do anything about it. Uh, and I guess for a certain extent, a lot of people are brought up thinking, you go to a policeman when you're in trouble. You elect the officials you want to represent you and run the country the way that you want. And what G20 was for me was just like, no, none of it is like that. There's a, there's a difference between believing that, believing the corruption, and knowing it. Because at G20, I knew it. I'm like, this happened to everybody so easily. What about the people that don't have a voice? Like, this system is in place for this to be have happened to them for years, for decades, since Whenever this is what the system has been working towards is to devalue these people's voices who need to talk about what happened. I mean, my complaint, I'll, you know, just, you know, former suburban white dude trying to get his police complaint in and everyone giving me the runaround. I can only imagine what, you know, I can't, you know, very, like maybe a small percentage about the communities that you're talking about where this is life. G20 is every day. And, and for me, there's a, a, a serious amount of guilt about the terms of the things that I prioritized before G20. It was a big wake-up call, but it took me being dragged off the street, torn away from my girlfriend, thrown in a cage, and begging for water until I passed out. I don't want that to be what it takes for the rest of the country. So there are, like, there are a million things to talk about in terms of G20 is every day. And I guess I felt that, well, what can I do? So we're doing this play, talking about what I saw and what happened. Not what I know since then, but just what horrified me into being a responsible human being. And that's what I'm trying to share with audiences so that they don't actually have to go through that, but at the same time they get that wake-up call. It's a, I guess, My question is for Tommy, but I guess the panel in general. Um, and I guess it's probably because, this is going to come as a shock to Tommy, I think I'm probably more skeptical than you are when it comes to the police. Do you really honestly think that either A, that footage exists, or B, you're ever going to see it? Because I really don't think you yes, are. And that, that's not a shot at you. You know I love you, but um, it's, I, don't, I, just, I, I think either it's incomplete, it's unusable, it never was there in the first place. Dummy well, cameras. thankfully, Bill Blair, right after G20, yeah. said, well, here people are complaining. Well, we have footage and audio from ev of everyone when the minute they stepped in to the minute they stepped out. <laughs> Did you believe it? I've yes, seen it. Yes, I've seen yes, somebody's yes, footage. A guy, Charlie Beach, who got arrested on the Friday, got uh, footage of his entire, you see him, he's by himself, in a cage, you see the entire detention center, you see the cops sitting around, 
talking, and they have all his footage. He got it through his Freedom of Information request. Eventually, yes, because it's it's there. It's been acknowledged. It's there, but they're not going to talk. Maybe you guys know a little bit more well, about the uh, footage. I think one, it's the one of the suggestions. I think they, they will have to if they cannot. I mean, certainly there are private information about other people, but they could uh, um, blur, it. blur it. I mean, it would not be the first time that they're redacting <laughs> document. I don't know. <laughs> so, so I think uh, there's there's way. I mean, there's this. There's the there's a lot of the, this. I think the system is is uh, as. There's many issues that need to be pushed uh, to, to get some clarity about uh, what went on.